Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you are the living light who transformed darkness into light. Through the blessings of this glorious Sunday, make us worthy to praise you with all those who saw the radiant light of your resurrection. We worship and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the living one who by his death gave life to his creation. By his resurrection he saved his church, gave joy to his flock, and brought us back to his Father, and enriched us with the gifts of his Spirit. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Only begotten Son, you were born of the Father before all ages, and by your creative will you separated light from darkness. On this, the first day of the week, you fashioned all creation to honor Adam, the image of your majesty. We praise and thank you and celebrate proclaiming, Blessed are you, for you appeared in the flesh on earth like us, and you lived among us. Blessed are you, for you were buried and counted among the dead, and you shined your light in the sadness of the tomb. Blessed are you, for you rose to life, giving good hope to all, and you filled the angels with radiance, and they appeared at your tomb like flashes of lightning. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make us worthy to rejoice in the glory of your radiant resurrection. Breathe life into our departed and make them worthy to stand at your right hand in your eternal light that you have prepared for those who love you. With them we praise and thank you for your graces and glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever.
Lord, accept the fragrance of our incense and our prayers, and may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. Amen. Kaddishat aloho kaddishat Shout with joy from the mountains, Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God, and with angels celebrate. From the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the Holy Ones and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the capstone. Through him, the whole structure is held together and grows into a temple sacred in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Praise be to God always.
to the praise, glory, and honor of the Most Holy Trinity. During this instance, before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and the salvation of our souls. Remain silent, listeners. The Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen to glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Evangelist Luke writes, Jesus came to Jericho, and he intended to pass through the town. Now there was a man there named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but he could not see him because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When he reached that place, Jesus looked up, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. And he came down quickly, and he received him with great joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, He has gone to stay at the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood there, and he said to the Lord, Behold, half of all my possessions, Lord, I shall give to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I shall pay it back four times over. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man also is a descendant of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the truth, peace be with you. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. This is a very strange story in the Gospel. Having this man run out, climb a tree, look at our Lord. And of course, we have to remember that Zacchaeus is well known in the area. He's a tax collector. This is why he's called a sinner. As a tax collector, he's the one who owns the, what we call the farm, farming the taxes. Rome sets how much tax has to come in annually, and he has the responsibility of bringing it in. He can call upon the Roman soldiers to enforce. There's no police force, it's just the soldiers. And of course, it's understood that, well, if you actually collect a bit more than you're going to give Rome, well, you can keep that. And so they were known as being extortionists because they could bring soldiers into your farm and say, okay, pay up. 
and then really name whatever it was that they were going to give. The second thing was is of course that they're working for the Roman pagan forces, which are an occupying force of Israel. So they're also considered not only extortionists, they're also considered to be traitors to Israel. That's why by the very fact of being publicans, by the very fact of being the tax administration, they're considered to be public sinners. The life that they live, what they've chosen to do as a career, is both traitorous and extortionist. And then St. Luke adds, and he's also very wealthy. Well, that kind of goes without saying. Remember when the Apostle Matthew is called, he's actually in his office doing his work. Caravaggio's done a magnificent painting of this conversion, the calling of Matthew. He has him in the moment of our Lord standing in the doorway calling him and Matthew getting up from his table. But as he gets up from the table, the artist has portrayed all the money rolling off. He's, jar he's jarring everything as he walks away from it. It's a very moving photo, uh, painting. So why I say this is strange is because when we look at this, Zacchaeus is well known. Another detail we can remember, this is Jericho. Jericho is the place where all the money was outside of Jerusalem. Jericho is Booth Bay. Jericho is where the people with money in Jerusalem, when they leave to go to camp, they go to Jericho. So he's not only a tax collector, he's a tax collector of one of the wealthiest areas of Israel. And then he does this, he's well known obviously to the people, and he does this really absurd thing to climb a tree so that he can see over the crowds waiting for our Lord, waiting for this rabbi to be able to see him. He doesn't go to the roof of a building, which he easily could have, He's so impetuous that he has to see this rabbi. He climbs a tree, and not only is the story so absurd, we remember what kind of tree it was he climbed. We're told specifically it's a sycamore. Who cares, right? But it's one of those things you remember in the story because it was just so weird. Now, if you got smacked in the back end by a purple van that had whatever painted on the side, you'd remember that detail because it's just you know, if you got hit by a VW hippie van, you would remember the hippie van and probably less about the actual accident just because it's so outstanding. So here's one of the wealthiest men in the whole district and he's hanging over this tree so that he can see our Lord coming by. So I say, this is a very strange story. And so it's obviously more than just curiosity. Curiosity would have been more reasonable. You just would have gone to the roofs, the flat roofs that they are in Palestine and just seen our Lord, no, you not only want, he wants to see our Lord, it's more than curiosity, he wants to be close too. If you're on the building of the house, one of the buildings, you're still gonna be a distance. You wanna see down, you wanna see him here. So it's more than just curiosity. So what this story is actually about is compassion and conversion. And what's interesting to see here is that this is unique to the Gospel of St. Luke. None of the other three Gospels tell us this story. The irony that's in this story, of course, is that Zacchaeus, who does all this effort to climb this tree and to really kind of publicly humiliate himself in front of everybody, thinks of himself certainly as trying to find our Lord, to see him. And yet the irony of the story is, is our Lord was looking for him all along. This is part of the aspect of conversion that we'll come back to. The context, and as always, try to read the ending of chapter 18 of St. Luke, and this is the beginning of chapter 19, today's gospel. The end of chapter 18 you also know already. It's the healing of the blind man outside of Jericho. In our tradition during Lent, we have the gospel read and we refer to him as being Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is his name given in the gospel. The blind man, can't see, he's begging. That's part of the context to understand the conversion of Zacchaeus that follows immediately after in the town. Outside the town, outside of Jericho, we have a beggar. And the only request he makes of our Lord is, Lord, that I may see. Give me the ability to get out of the darkness that occupies my life, that makes me a beggar. 
That's the beginning of conversion, is to realize I really have hit rock bottom. The, one of the greatest sins of Christians in the modern world is complacency. We think everything we do is wonderful and Jesus just loves whatever we do because Jesus just loves us. It's complacency. We used to call it presumption, and it's a sin. Bartimaeus knows that he's blind. That's why he's reduced to begging. He's not complacent. And when our Lord asks him, what do you want me to do for you? He says, Lord, that I can see. Take me out of this blindness. Our Lord knows exactly what he needs, but he makes him say it. This is different. And then we have the episode of Zacchaeus. Then following this episode and the dinner that our Lord's going to have and staying at Zacchaeus' house, he now tells the parable of the famous one of the king who divides up and confides his wealth to three of his ministers, three of his stewards. And then he goes away for a long time. And he comes back and he, he demands that they have made it fruitful. And so the one who receives only one part of all of the treasury, who hasn't done anything except keep the one part and just gives it back to him, he's condemned for not having to brought to fruition the things that were confided to him. That's what follows conversion. God gives us so much. And I don't just mean the trees and the bunny rabbits and the stars, which are pretty enough, but that's what he gives us is interior. And what we do with it to make it fruitful, when the king returns on the day of judgment, he expects that the talents and the qualities that he's given us have borne fruit, that we haven't just rendered them back exactly as they were given to us, sterile. And this is the basis to understand the collaboration that takes place. If you look in our prayer at today's Mass, you have in the beginning of the Husoyo, or in the Sedro, I believe, it says that you give life to your creation. This is a peculiar thing to say, because by creation means everything that exists and lives and acts now. But you give life to your creation. So what does this possibly mean? We forget that there are two levels in which God creates the world. And for the handful of people that were there at Friday's Mass in St. Jude's for the day because the Gospel came up, You'll have to excuse me because it'll be a bit repetitive. When God creates everything that exists, every tree, bunny rabbit, every rock, every human being that exists, exists because God loves them. God has loved from eternity and chosen to make things exist. If it exists, it is loved by the divinity, period. Philosophically, that's the foundation. And God governs those things which he makes. We call it providence. Providence is not that I win the lottery. Providence is the guidance of all things in creation according to their nature. The birds that swoop through the air, the pigeons that poop on your car, they're all doing exactly what they're supposed to do by their nature. Even though no one really wants it done to their car. But the animals, what they do according, God leads them by their nature. And the nature of the bears, the nature of the animals, the nature of the birds, the plants, he guides them all and they're doing exactly what they are supposed to do. They fulfill God's will perfectly. So what about the nature of human beings? We have minds, and we have wills, we have free, we can choose. And this is an important part. This is the giving of life to creation. So yes, while we say that any baby born on the face of the earth, any child, any human being that comes into existence is loved by God, that's only the first part of the story. That's a love that's the same kind of love which is given to the pigeon who's pooed on your car. But because we are human beings that have minds and wills and we are free, God directs our natures also according to our nature, which is in its freedom of free will and of mind to know and to love. 
And that's the grace that we call that God is giving to everyone in calling us. Remember the whole meaning behind the word of the church, ecclesia in the Greek. It means the assembly from being called out, the people who are called out of the fallen world. That is calling to life, giving life to creation. Those are the intelligent beings who respond to that gift that is given to them and they respond freely or they refuse freely. Whichever it is, their response is going to be according to their liberty, according to their nature. But it's not an indifferent thing. Whether we respond to this gift or not respond to this gift, of course, means heaven or hell. It means healing of salvation or perdition. And so this giving of life to creation as mentioned in the Cedro, we call, this is your catechism vocabulary for today, it's called prevenient grace. Venire in Latin means to come, prevenire means to come before. Prevenient grace, not preventative, Prevenient grace means that gift of God's calling to our freedom and to our minds, the enlightenment, ultimately what's the faith, for us to respond and turn to him. Because as St. Augustine says, the God who created us without us will not save us without us. That freedom of our nature has to be engaged or salvation is not attained. That's why I say, unfortunately, in the modern world, one of the great sins amongst Christians is complacency. We just think that everything we do is good because God loves us. Now, who, which of you has any kind of relationship or marriage where you just put up with whatever from the other person? It doesn't exist. If people are offensive to us, they're offensive to us. It doesn't matter if we're married to them. It's still offensive. Love doesn't mean that we're stupid. And it, when we say that God loves creation and brings salvation, God is certainly not stupid any more than we are in relationships with our friends and our family. That's why I say the story is ironic because Zacchaeus thinks he's trying to find this rabbi of Galilee. But the rabbi has been looking for him preveniently the whole time. Which is why when he arrives at the spot, we're told by St. Luke, he looks up in the tree and he calls him by name. Zachai, come down. Hopefully your wife's made a good, a good meal for this evening because I'm staying at your place. And so the prevenient grace, this is the compassion. And that's the second aspect that we finish with today. Linked with that complacency in the modern, among modern Christians, is also a very strange idea about mercy and compassion. Mercy and compassion so often when it's spoken of means condoning. Mercy is sp somehow supposed to mean that because my sister shacked up with the third man she's met or lived with, that mercy means, well, you know, I won't judge. And no, if she shacked up with the third guy, she shacked up with the third guy. She's living in fornication or adultery or whatever it may be. No, it doesn't mean I smack her around. But it means I have eyes to see to know that she is wounded profoundly in her human life. Every time you see our Lord showing compassion, it's a different thing. Compassion doesn't mean condoning. Condoning is to say, okay, fine, we'll just put up with whatever you choose to do. It's very much linked to that complacent idea of what we call Christian charity, but it's not Christian charity. It's complacency. Complacency and condoning are very much connected. It's why our churches are empty. Because if in the end Jesus loves you no matter what you do, and as a Christian you're just supposed to put up with whatever, well then why do you go to church? I can do whatever and stay home and watch football. I can do whatever and go grocery shopping. I can do whatever and go fishing. So in the end, all of your millennial children and the last two generations of children have all said, the religion you're communicating to me is stupid. Because complacent condoning is stupid. I'm sorry to say, it is stupid. But if you go to a parish which is serious and you see the places where, where the religion is actually treasured, you will always find it filled with children and young families. Because religion is not about an age group. 
Religion is about turning towards the Lord of the grace of the light that he gives us, giving life to his creation. Pope Francis refers to the church as being a field hospital. The world is screwed up in many ways. In many ways, it's gorgeous. But on a human level, it's totally mucked up. And you have wounded and hemorrhaging people laying all around this field of battle, of what we've usually called the Valley of Tears. And Francis has said that the, the church is a field hospital dragging in these hemorrhaging people who are missing arms, limbs. Think of all the pictures you've seen of the Civil War. That's the image. And so that those who have been healed in that field hospital, even if we go limping out, missing a limb, but we're healed, it's cauterized, we're okay now. We're not going to die in the next day. We know that what's in this tent brings healing and you start dragging in these hemorrhaging, gasping, moaning people that are outside. When our Lord shows compassion, it is always to heal. Never once in any of these individuals does his compassion mean he just puts up with their sin. Never. The adulterous woman who's thrown down in front of him the famous, let him who's without sin cast the first stone, and they all start leaving. In the end, when he looks at the woman, he says to her, now go and do not sin again. Which tells us we know she was actually an adulteress. But he tells her, you must not do this. When he heals the man who's been sick for 38 years at the miraculous pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem, after he heals him, he says, now you go and do not sin again, lest something worse befall you. There is never an occasion that you will find in the gospel that our Lord will condone the wounds because sin is a wound. It destroys our life. And regardless of what my sister may think, and my sister's not shacked up with the third guy. It's just an example to say my instead of always saying you. My sister shacked up with the third guy. She may walk around buttering, you know, flatter, you know, uh, batting her eyes and say, say that she loves him. But in the end, she's wounded. And this is a wounded relationship. Her life cannot be the place where God expects it to be because she's hemorrhaging. She's wounded. Now, we've said our Lord said her to be fully restored and integrated by grace. That's Zacchaeus, and that's why now it makes much more sense, this last detail. When Zacchaeus comes shimmying down the tree, and the, there's some people in the crowd who are like, well, this is ridiculous, this man's a public sinner, and this rabbi is gonna go off and stay in his house. It's polluting in the Mosaic law. You can't do that, it's, it's polluting, it makes you unclean. Our Lord totally ignores what they have to say. That's where the compassion comes in. Don't give me this interpretation. I'm here to heal him. And Zacchaeus' immediate reaction in front of everyone is to make reparation. This is truly a conversion. It's, not, it's the recognition, one, I am in a bad place. And because I'm in a bad place, I have to fix it. This is why complacent Christians never fix anything in their lives, because they think it's right. But Zacchaeus knows that it's not right, which is why he immediately says, half of everything I have, Lord, I will give to the poor. Good start, excellent. He's probably still gonna be very rich even with half of what he has left, but still, I'll give half of it away. And then he says, and if I've extorted, fraud, defrauded anyone, I will repay him four times over. Now, to know the Mosaic law, if you were defrauded under the law of Moses, you had to restore it twice, double over it. Not just simply give them back what you took from them, you had to double what you gave. It's punishment for you. So when Zacchaeus stands there, this is a Jew, he knows the law of Moses, he knows what he's been doing for all of these years. And so when Zacchaeus says that if I've extorted anyone, which everyone, of course, probably would have been laughing in their sleeve, thinking, oh yeah, of course, that's how you became so wealthy. If I've extorted from anyone, I will repay four times over, not just twice. That's why our Lord says salvation this day has come to this house because of his conversion. And we leave you with that one last detail. 
There's only one person that our Lord is talking to, Zacchaeus. But he says salvation has come to this house because this is also a son of Abraham. Abraham's whole story is one of conversion. We don't need to go into it of detail. But you notice that because Zacchaeus does what is right, his personal conversion, healing, which is all that salvation means, healing comes to his whole household. Through him, he becomes a lamp and a source of healing to those in his family. That's a very important thing to remember. And that's why I said, I may never get my blueberry muffins, or I may never have my sister change from this third guy that she's shacked up with, but I will always be praying, at least, and fasting, that the light of salvation be brought, not just to me personally. Christianity is not just about me. Christianity is about a body. So that through me, salvation will come. And so may God give us that grace to see, Lord, that I may see. May he give us the strength by his grace to turn toward the Lord profoundly. And in doing so, may we hear the ability to become lamps to others and bring this salvation through us as conduits and hear those words that our Lord says that this day salvation has come to this house because he also, turning, is a child of Abraham. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Telvat ma debhe da loho, varvat ar loho da pare tamiu. Aino suvo taino tao ke yular baito pesku da payeko ato.
Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure, and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with your hearts and souls, and with a holy kiss worthy of your blessed name that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. For your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation, and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us, because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One with your only Son and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Father, with your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, one and indivisible in nature, and you sanctify all things by your divine power. For our salvation you sent your Son into the world. He descended, became flesh, and suffered, and was crucified for us, who had distorted his image. In Sabe Lachmo Bida, Kodi Shoto, O Bara Hukade, Waksuya Beltalmi Tao Kodo Mara, Sabahola Mehene, Kulho, Hono Denita, Fahro. Oh 
Kanno alko so dam sich wo men hamro wo men mayon ara ko padesh ya bel talmita o karo mara sab stau mehne kul ko o no denita de mo dilan dianti ki khadato Dachlo faikun wachlof sagie Mete shadu meti hel Khosoyon khawme wa khayin al alam alami This in memory of me, for whenever you eat this body and drink this blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Christ our God, we remember your plan of salvation, and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels, and all await the reward they deserve, and when you place the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household, and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart, and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather, treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, O oh Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O oh God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O oh my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, anin morio, ni te modrojo chayu kadisho. Una gen alain wal korbono hono. By his descent he may make this friend the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them, cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts, and be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever. Lord, we now remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them, we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith. 
that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory, we pray to you, O Lord. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offerings upon this altar and those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, Saint Joseph, St. Marin, St. Jude, St. Rafka, and St. Tekla, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have loved us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They waned for you in your life-giving hope. Prize them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed and forgive the sins we have committed with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. God the Father, you accept prayers and you answer petitions. You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and clear consciences, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the 
kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil, for you have power over all. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. With your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries, to join the assembly of your saints, that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your holy cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So a hearty welcome to our visitors to St. Joseph's. We have extra copies of books on the Maronite Church that are in the, in the pews. You are more than welcome to take the copy with you. It gives you an explanation of our Antiochian tradition. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and the blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. 